For this video, I wanted to cover the IRS Form 5472 filing for a foreign-owned U.S. disregarded LLC. So I've got a number of topics that I want to cover in this video, and then we'll close with a sample 5472. Uh, but first, we're going to start with some background information on the form, right? Who needs to file this form? What information is reported? Uh, and then second there on the bulleted point, big warning letters. I can't stress this enough. What I'm going to cover are some scenarios and tax uh, circumstances where filing this form alone is not sufficient. Okay, so these are going to be scenarios where you might have a foreign owned U.S. disregarded LLC, but you owe tax, right? You owe tax in the U.S. If you owe tax in the U.S., your filing scenario is significantly more complicated than what I'm going to outline as an example in this video. So you need to be very careful to consult with a tax advisor before you start filing any of this, because if you get this wrong, you're going to be in some big trouble, right? It's not a good position to be in. Third bullet point there, where and how to file, right? So we'll cover where to file this with the IRS, what are the appropriate mailing addresses, fax numbers. Um, and then lastly, like I said, we're gonna cover a sample fact pattern and then a sample form 5472 that would be submitted for a foreign owned disregarded LLC. Okay, so let's move to the first slide here. Who needs to file this form? Um, so the form 5472 is filed with a pro forma 1120, right? And this is filed if you have a US LLC that is disregarded from its owner and the owner is a foreign person. Okay, so some background on LLCs. When you form an LLC in the United States, if it has one owner, it is by default a disregarded entity. That means the entity legally exists under state law, so you can enter into contracts, you can open bank accounts for it, uh, the entity can be sued, it can provide you liability protection. But from a tax perspective, it's almost completely transparent, right? So all income and expense basically flows through to the owner, whether that's an individual or a company, and that entity or that person is the one that's reporting the income and expense and paying any tax, if any. Now, if the LLC has one owner and it files an entity classification election to be taxed as a C-Corp, it's no longer a disregarded entity. And I really wanna make this distinction clear because there are a lot of LLCs out there that are foreign owned, they have one owner, but they made an entity classification election to be taxed as a US taxable C Corp. Okay, if you've done that, then you're no longer a disregarded entity. You're a regarded entity, right? You're a regarded entity that is subject to tax in the US as a C corporation. Okay, and so uh, that, that filing um, uh, scenario is, is also completely different from this, right? So this tutorial wouldn't work um, if you are a, an LLC that filed a C Corp election and you have foreign owners, right? Completely different set of filings and procedures. Now, let's talk about who's a foreign person for US tax purposes. Um, it's either a foreign individual, foreign partnership, foreign corporation, can even be a foreign trust. Basically, you're looking at anybody that's not a U.S. person. So in an individual context, um, U.S. persons are um, U.S. citizens, right? U.S. citizens are U.S. persons no matter where they live and work. They're always U.S. persons. If you have a U.S. green card, you're going to be a U.S. person. And then the third one is if you meet the substantial presence test, right? So if you're a non-resident of the U.S., and you move to the United States, or even if you're here on just a tourist visa, if you spend too many days in the United States, your presence within the United States can make you a U.S. tax resident. So if you become a U.S. tax resident and you're no longer a foreign person, then this might apply to you if you own a disregarded LLC. Foreign corporation partnership, simply you're just looking at where's the entity formed, right? So if I set up a Bermuda corporation, that's a foreign corporation. If I go to um, the Cayman Islands and I set up a limited partnership in Cayman, that's a Cayman LP, it's a foreign partnership. Even if the partnership has all US owners, right? It's still a partnership formed under a non-US jurisdictions law. So it's a foreign entity, okay? Um, then lastly there, uh, what is broadly kind of the triggering filing requirement here, right? So form 5472 for foreign owned DRE, 
has got to be filed if there's any reportable transactions during the year. And uh, what we'll talk a little bit about later, virtually every LLC is going to have a reportable transaction in this context. And that's because it really covers a broad range of potential transactions that can occur between the entity and the owner. Okay. All right. Let's look at the next slide here. Now, this is the where the warning slides start. Like I said at the beginning, this tutorial and what I'm going to cover here really only works if the entity is not subject to any U.S. taxes. If it is, then you have a completely different set of procedures to file taxes. You're still actually filing a 5472 with a Pro Form 1120, but it's completed differently. And the owner of the LLC also has some tax filing obligations, which I'll, which I'll highlight here, but we're not going to cover in, in detail. So where, um, what kind of situations would you be needing to do more than just what's outlined in this tutorial? Well, if the LLC or the owner via the LLC is engaged in U.S. trader business, and has any U.S. source effectively connected income, it's going to be subject to tax in the United States, right? Um, so, of course, this begs the question, well, what's a U.S. trader business, right? Well, a U.S. trader business is not specifically defined uh, in the tax code. It, there's a lot of, there's some case law, there's some regulation around this, but it's a very gray area. And this is why um, it's so important that you do this analysis first because if it's determined that you're engaged in U.S. trader business and you owe tax, like I said, this filing uh, procedure doesn't work for you. The other, the other um, issue that could arise is if your LLC is receiving income that's U.S. source FEDAP income and it's not properly being subject, subjected to withholding tax. Okay, and we'll talk about that one on the next slide. But first, I want to talk about this U.S. TOB issue. So if you have a U.S. TOB, the beneficial owner of the LLC now has to file returns and pay taxes. So if you're a foreign individual, let's say you're an individual living and working in the U.K., you have a disregarded LLC and you're engaged in trader business, the individual now has to file a 1040 NR, a non-resident tax return, report the income, report your expenses, and pay taxes. Okay, so in order to be able to file the 1040NR, you need an I-10, right? That's a whole nother uh, process to get that assigned to you. Um, so you get your I-10, you prepare the 1040NR, you prepare the Schedule C, you report your income, you pay the tax, okay? Foreign corporations, similar issue, right? If your uh, disregarded LLC is owned by a foreign corporate entity, the foreign corporation needs to file an 1120F report the income, report the expenses, and pay taxes. Um, in order to do that, it needs its own EIN, right? So employer uh, identification number, EIN, that needs to be assigned for the foreign entity before it can file its 1120F. Now here's the real scary part. If it's determined you're engaged in U.S. trader business and you did not file returns to pay the taxes, if the IRS catches you and, and they determine that you had a U.S. TOB, not only are you reporting the income now, but they can actually disallow the deductions, okay? So imagine that. Imagine you're running a business, you do a million in revenue, um, and then the IRS later determines, well, you had a USTOB, so you got to report one mil in gross revenue, and you get no deductions in computing your taxable income. So if you're an individual uh, engaged at US LLC, you're looking at 37% tax rate, Right, that's the that's going to be the rate on the income of million dollars, three hundred seventy thousand dollar tax bill because you got this wrong. Corporations, it's equally troubling, right? If you had a foreign corporate entity that owned that LLC, you didn't file the eleven twenty F. Now you're reporting the income. The corporate tax rate is twenty one percent. So let's say that same million dollars, you're looking at a million times twenty one percent, so two hundred ten k. But foreign corporations are also subject to what's called the branch profits tax, or BPT for short. So you're looking at another hit there as far as uh, additional tax exposure. Um, and this is why a lot of companies file on a protective basis. So I have separate videos on that. I'll put a link below. Uh, but a lot of foreign corporations that are engaged in business with some kind of U.S. nexus, but they feel like it doesn't give rise to a U.S. trader business, 
they file an 1120F on a protective measure because if it is audited later down the road and the IRS challenges it and the company was wrong, they can prepare a return and claim the deductions, right? So you don't lose your ability to claim tax deductions <clears throat> if you file on a protective basis, okay? Very, very important. All right, so let's move on to the next slide talking about the FEDAP issue. So <clears throat> the other, um, that second bullet point on the previous slide I was talking about where if you have U.S. source FEDAP income passing through and it wasn't subject to withholding tax, you've got, a ta you've got another tax problem on your hands, right? So what is FEDAP income? U.S. source FEDAP income is fixed, determinable, annual, or periodical. So this is income from U.S. sources, interest, dividends, rents, royalties, other types of fixed payments that when they are paid to a non-U.S. person, they are subject to withholding tax at source, okay? So if, for example, you're a non-U.S. person and you have a brokerage account and you're getting paid $1,000 of U.S. source dividends from, let's say it's Apple, right? The broker is required to withhold 30% on the $1,000 in dividends, send that to the IRS, and then you get the difference of 700. That's the standard, right? So the broker takes the dividends off the top or the dividend tax off the top, gives you the difference, and then that's it. Now, the issue with this is it's a joint and several liability, meaning that the broker is kind of the first line of defense to make sure the tax is collected. But if they miss it, and you're a non-US person and you owe this tax, now you're the one responsible for filing a tax return and paying the taxes, okay? So how does this, how, how does this issue arise? Well, where I see it happen most frequently is when non-US persons will open brokerage accounts through LLCs and they mess up the withholding certificates. So for example, if you open an LLC and then you say, I want to open a U.S. brokerage account through that LLC, and it's a disregarded LLC, and that's fine. The broker will do that for you. They normally call it a commercial account, but they'll still do it for you. Then when you go through the process of filling out the withholding certificate, because you have a disregarded LLC, you should be filling out either a WA Ben or a WA Ben E. But instead, to kind of get the paperwork to look right, you kind of fudge the numbers a bit or fudge the tax interview to fill out a W-9 instead. Here's the problem. W-9s should only be filled out by U.S. persons, okay? If you have a disregarded LLC with a foreign owner, you are not a U.S. person. You should not be filling out a W-9. The broker thinks you're a U.S. person, so they don't withhold the tax. So two big issues. One, you kind of perjured yourself by completing the wrong withholding certificate, right? I mean, it's you basically lied for banking purposes about your tax residency, so that's obviously not good. And then the second piece is this withholding problem. The broker should have been withholding tax, and it's not because you completed the paperwork incorrectly, so now you've got to file a tax return to correct this problem, okay? So again, number two, very, very, pro very problematic. If you've got U.S. source FDAP income, there's no withholding tax, now you've got to go through the same process, file a 1040NR, right? If you're an individual that owns that LLC, you've got to report the dividends, pay the tax. If the um, US LLC brokerage account, if the ultimate owner is that foreign corporation, you're filing an 1120F now, reporting the income, paying the tax. Um, so this is where, again, this Form 5472 filing tutorial doesn't really work for you if you have messed up one of these two issues. All right, so let's look at the next slide here, uh, covering where and how to file. So uh, where to file, uh, the, the Form 5472 filing right now as of 2022 can only be filed via paper, like mail. So you've got to print it out, sign it, mail it to the IRS. There's a specific address that you should use. It's within the form instructions, or you can fax it. Um, you might be thinking, well, what about e-file? There's no e-filing mechanism for this kind of form yet. Even though you can bring up the 5472 and the 1120 in tax software, you can't file a pro forma 1120 with the 5472 for this type of filing. So you can still use tax software to prepare the forms, but you're still going to have to print them out 
sign them, and then again, either fax or mail them to the appropriate IRS office or address, okay? Um, and then the other issue there, you know, point number three, because this is not e-file, there's really no way to get a confirmation receipt. If you fax it, it just goes through. The IRS doesn't send you a return confirmation. Uh, they're definitely not gonna do that. Um, if you mail it to them, again, there's no confirmation that it's being processed. You can mail via certified mail, which gets you a delivery receipt, right? So if you mail something and it goes to the IRS, they sign for it, you'll get a delivery confirmation if you send it through you know, UPS or FedEx. Uh, but again, you're not getting any confirmation that it was received and processed uh, by the IRS. Okay. Now, filing deadlines. It's file. Uh, the deadline is April 15th or you know, April 18th. It depends on whether the deadline falls on a weekend or not. But April 15th is is that target every year. Um, obviously, you always check the due dates every year because if it does fall on a weekend, then they move it a couple days. Um, so always be careful of that. Now, we'll talk about failing file. Uh, the penalty is severe, right? If you have a 5472 and you fail to file this timely, and even if it doesn't owe tax, right? If you are in, if you are in the position with this fact pattern I'm going to go through and you owe no tax, the IRS doesn't care. If you had to file a 5472 because you have a foreign owned disregard entity, you had reportable transactions, you have got to file or else you'll get a penalty notice for 25K. Right, big enough to put a lot of companies out of business. Um, now let's talk about extension requests, right? So extension requests can be submitted if you feel like you need more time. Um, extensions for businesses are submitted via Form 7004. There are additional procedures in the Form 5472 instructions to submit those. You have to, again, complete it by hand, print it out, sign it, and then you write um, a foreign owned U.S. disregard entity on the top, and then you can mail or fax it to the same office, uh, and then they'll process an extension request for you. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the fact pattern next. Okay, so here is our sample fact pattern. Now, what I've done in this fact pattern is I have created a scenario where almost nobody would ever suggest that this entity was engaged in U.S. trader business or it has any kind of U.S. source FEDAP issue where there wasn't proper withholding, okay? So, and, and what, we'll, what you'll see when I go through this example is that not only these facts are gonna be in line with your business, right? You might have some U.S. nexus, you might for, for this reason or that reason, and yeah, that, that's of course the real world. And so this is why it's so important that don't just file this without consulting with a tax attorney that, that specializes in this cross-border tax issue uh, because you're not gonna get a clean cut list of what constitutes engaged in US trader business. You just won't. So it's very important to analyze all the facts and circumstances surrounding your business operations and see whether or not you have that US TOB issue. So here's our example. We've got Albert Person. Uh, Albert's obviously a fake person. He's a citizen and resident of France. He's not a U.S. citizen, nor does he have a U.S. green card, um, and he doesn't meet the substantial presence test. So Albert in no way is a U.S. person for federal tax purposes. Albert lives and works full-time from Paris. Okay. Now Albert wants to start a bookkeeping business. So he opens a Delaware LLC. He calls it Albert Bookkeeping Fake Company LLC. Uh, and he launches this thing in September 2021. And he's going to be the sole 100% owner, right? So he's the sole owner. By default, it's a disregarded entity. Then he decides that he's not going to make an election via 8832 to make the entity taxable as a C-Corp. Okay, again, yeah, very important. If you make an election to be taxed as a C-Corp, this tutorial is not for you. This does not work. You have different filing obligations. Your entity is paying tax in the U.S., you still have 5472 disclosures, but again, different different procedures. So the, the LLC remains a foreign owned DRE or disregarded entity for federal tax purposes. Um, so second bullet point here in the fact pattern, Albert hires a Delaware company to act as the registered agent. That's fine, right? Every US LLC, every US company, whatever state you set up the entity in needs a local registered agent. That's okay. Now. Third point there, Albert creates a, a website for his business. He advertises his business as a French-based uh, bookkeeping business. 
Uh, the business address and phone number for his business are advertised as being located in France, right? So he is holding himself out to the community that he is a French-based business, right? He's based in Paris, France. Um, Albert opens a bank account for his LLC, and he goes to a TransferWise. Um, TransferWise, he goes to the UK branch. So this is a UK-based account. It's not even a U.S. bank account. And uh, form of payments, he accepts U.S. dollars. Uh, British pounds and, and euros, okay? Uh, then, as far as his business operations, Albert signs up five clients. Three of those are based in France, and then two are based in Germany. So he doesn't even have any U.S. clients, right? But he's got this U.S. LLC. Um, and then lastly there, Albert doesn't travel to the U.S. for work, nor does he have any U.S.-based employees or contractors, right? He might sub out some work through Upwork or something like that, um, but nobody's based in the U.S. Now, given this fact pattern, Albert still needs to file this 5472 with a pro form 1120, right? He's got a U.S. LLC. Um, it's set up in Delaware. It's foreign owned. It's disregarded. He needs to file this form. In this fact pattern, it's pretty clear that Albert doesn't have a U.S. trader business. He's got no connection to the U.S. whatsoever except for just having this entity, right? So in this fact pattern, it's, it's comforting or we're comfortable to kind of come to the conclusion that um, Albert's business is not engaged in U.S. trader business, so he doesn't have any U.S. tax exposure. Okay, so now, now that we look through the fact pattern, uh, let's pull up the uh, sample 5472. Okay, so here is the sample 5472 that we have in front of us. This is for uh, Albert's fake bookkeeping LLC. Um, so the form, pro, the form 1120 basically acts like a cover page, right? So form 5472 is where you're entering most of the information. And then the 1120 acts as a cover sheet that has some information. So when it's sent to the IRS, um, they know, you know what kind of entity it is and how to key it into the system. So some of the basics here. So obviously in, um, at the top here, we have the name of the LLC. We have the EIM date the entity was formed, and then the mailing address for the company, right? So he's based in Paris, so he's got Rue du Lac 999 in Paris, France. Um, you can use a U.S. address, but again, in this example, Albert doesn't have any kind of U.S. addresses. He doesn't have a U.S. forwarding address, uh, a U.S. virtual office, nothing like that. Um, so it's okay for him to use his Paris, uh, France address. Um, at the top, you are supposed to write foreign owned USDE. So foreign owned US disregarded entity. Okay, now that's important because not only do the form instructions ask you to do that, but it also indicates to the IRS that this is not an 1120 filing for a corporation. This is an 1120 filing for a foreign owned disregarded LLC, and the 1120 is just the cover sheet. Okay, now most of the 1120 is going to be blank. Um, so Schedule C is blank, um, Schedule J, again, no, co no tax computation here, so that's blank. Um, starting in Schedule K, now the form instructions say that you can leave Schedule K blank, right? You don't have to answer these questions. However, um, some tax software requires you to kind of answer these questions to be able to generate some of the additional forms that you need. So for example, um, down here um, in question seven. So one of these questions is, if did at any time one foreign person own at least 25% or more of the stock? Um, in order to get the 5472 to populate, you might have to answer that yes, um, and then enter 100% owned by somebody who lives in France. And so that'll trigger the form 5472 filing. Um, and then you can complete the 5472. So if that's the case, again, the, the IRS instructions say that these aren't required, but if you fill them out for whatever reason, that's fine. You won't get penalized for that. So in this case, we did go ahead and complete the Schedule K. So it's a bookkeeping business. Answered all these questions here. Most of them are no. Obviously down here, we are answering yes. We have one owner. Um, he's a French uh, citizen and tax resident. Line item number 10. Um, it says, um, uh, enter the number of shareholders during the year. Um, let's see, so let me go down to the next page here. Um, Schedule K, 
um, information on the corporate receipts, right? Yes, no, no, no's, all these are no's down here. And then we'll scroll down, balance sheet, again, you can leave that blank. Schedule G, you don't have to attach this, you could, but this is used to report information on, on, on individuals that own um, more than a certain percentage of the stock. In this case, we have Albert Person here, right? He has no USIB number, he's a French um, citizen, and he owns 100% of the company. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. So this is the meat of the uh, 5472. Um, okay, so the 5472, uh, let's see. So we have the name of the reporting corporation. So the reporting corporation is the LLC, right? So we have Albert Bookkeeping, Fake Company LLC, the EIM, uh, street address, principal business activity, principal business activity codes, um, on lines 1F and 1H. So these are the reportable transactions. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail on how to calculate those. I have actually have a, a course where I go through this whole thing um, and with a lot of different examples how to arrive at those uh, um, co contributions to and from the entity. Um, so in this example, I've already kind of just jumped, a, jumped ahead a few steps and uh, 13,205 is the number of uh, reportable con uh, contributions that we have during the year. And so those numbers are entered there. 1G, uh, we have just one Form 5472 filing. And then in 1J, we've indicated that it, this is the first year we're filing this thing. Now, country of incorporation, obviously that's where the entity was set up. This is a US LLC, so we have the United States. And then lines 1, uh, 1N and 1O, uh, principal countries where business is conducted. In this section, you want to indicate where it is you're actually doing business. Now, if you were doing business in the U.S. and you were you had that U.S. trader business issue, um, then yeah, you're you're a resident of the United States, so you're filing tax returns there. But in this case, the LLC, the business, is a tax resident of France, right? So business is conducted in France. Uh, we're reporting all this income and expense in France. And so that's why we've indicated FR, that's the country code abbreviation for France. All right, uh, lines two and three, right? So check off both. I mean, obviously this is, you know, one, for, one foreign person owns more than 50% of the company, that's yes. And then line item three, yes, we are. We're filing this because the reporting corporation is a foreign owned disregarded LLC, right? Now part two, foreign shareholder information so um this is again who's the beneficial owner of the company uh, so we have albert person um, his mailing address there again with the u.s tax id number if you don't have one um, then foreign u.s is an appropriate placeholder if you have an i-10 then you could put that in there right so i-10s are issued to non-residents um, that aren't necessarily tax residents. So if you have one, you can enter that there. Again, a lot of people have ITINs for banking purposes, or maybe they were once a U.S. tax resident and then moved, and they're no longer a resident, but they maintain the ITIN. So, yeah, again, you don't need one um, for purposes of this fact pattern and example, so you can use foreign U.S., um, but if you do have a U.S. ID number, you can enter that there in 4B1. Now, the reference ID number, this has to be filled out if you don't have a U.S. tax ID number. So reference ID number is it's, almost, it's any number you want to make up. It's basically a, a number, a string of characters or numbers that you should use consistently from year to year to identify yourself as a foreign person. So if Albert, this is the first year he's filing, when he files subsequent Form 5472s year after year, he should continue to use the same reference ID number. Uh, and that makes it easier for the IRS to kind of trace from year to year um, what he is invested in. Foreign taxpayer ID number, if you have one, go ahead and enter it. Obviously, uh, France imposes income taxes, so France has tax ID numbers for their uh, citizens and residents. I believe it's a 13-digit ID number over in France, so um, you can enter that there. But uh, again, th there's some countries that don't issue you, uh, tax IDs. Um, you know, one such example is um, a lot of uh, tax haven countries, right? So a lot of countries that don't impose income tax don't see the point in issuing one, right? So they won't issue one. Um, lines 4C3, again, where's the business conducted? 
where are you a citizen or where if this was an entity that owned the LLC, where is it incorporated, where is it organized? And then lastly, it's asking under whose laws do you file an income tax return as a resident, right? So we're communicating here to the IRS that we are a French citizen and tax resident. So we are filing French income tax returns because that's where we are resident. All right. Uh, second page here, part three, related party. This has got to be completed too. Um, so the related party here is a foreign person and it's Albert. Again, we're entering the same information, use the same reference ID number consistently. Um, and then the relationship here, we're indicating that we are the foreign shareholder, right? So you can file 5472s anytime there's a related party to the company, but it's not necessarily an owner. Right, so, it, but in this case, it is, right? So Albert is both the direct owner, 100% of the company, and Albert is also the related party that's conducting business for the entity. So he's the 25% he's the, uh, or greater uh, foreign shareholder. Um, and then 8F and 8G, same thing as before on the other page for Albert, right? Where is business being conducted and under whose laws does he file an income tax return? Uh, France, right? Now, part four, monetary transaction. So if the entity was engaged in U.S. trader business and was subject to tax and had to compute income and expense, this is where you would enter the monetary transactions between the reporting corp and the foreign related party. Um, and the instructions very clearly say that you would only enter items here if they are used in calculating your net taxable income. In this case, we don't have any net taxable income to report in the United States. So that's why those fields are all blank. That's okay. But again, if you are engaged in U.S. trader business, you need to complete this um, in, in an entirely different manner, right? And so if that was the case, then you would likely see something in part four. Okay. And then the last two pieces there, uh, part five and part six, we have description of reportable transactions and non-monetary transactions. I've checked off both um, um, boxes here for these because we're going to have an attachment. So my, uh, my video is kind of cutting off the corner there, but I do check both boxes for these. And then on the second page, or at the very end we have the supporting statement but you want to check both boxes for those complete part seven right this is for well complete part seven this is additional information that might apply again in this example in this fact pattern we don't have any of these kind of issues so there's just no's for all of them um, and then in parts uh, eight cost sharing arrangement again it's all no's right this would be an issue um, if you had an entity that was a taxable entity in the united states Okay, so then the last piece there, um, the supporting statements, right? So what we've done is we've attached two supporting statements. So I'll start with the, the bottom one there, um, the question in part six. What we're indicating here is there's a non-monetary relationship going on between the uh, foreign owner and the LLC. And the non-monetary relationship is that that person is running the business, right? So the foreign related party is the member manager of the company. He's the greater than 25% owner. He's the 100% owner. Um, and so that is that is a relationship you should be disclosing to the uh, IRS. And then again, um, the um, reportable transactions, the actual cash reportable transactions between the company are the capital contributions and distributions. And so capital contributions for the year, 2000 bucks in, and then distributions out on a gross basis, 11205 Um And again, I won't, uh, we can, I can spend a whole video covering how to calculate capital contributions and distributions of what, what counts and what doesn't. Um, but I'll, I'll put a link below uh, to a course I have where it covers uh, those issues in a little more detail. Um, but again, you should disclose um, that you're a foreign owned DRE, you don't have any US trader business, no ECI, and then disclose the contributions and distributions that are happening during the year. Okay, so um, let me just scroll back up, make sure I didn't miss anything here. Um, yeah, so, so that covers it. So again, what should be done next is once the return is all completed and done, and again, you're certain that you are not engaged in US trader business. Can't stress that enough, right? If you have a USTOB issue, um, then this doesn't work for you, right? I mean, 
thank you for watching, but <laughs> the whole the whole the whole exercise uh, doesn't work. You really need to consult with a tax attorney that does international tax and is familiar with this space so they can give you some more comfort surrounding whether your activities in the US, right? Do you have US customers? Do you have US bank accounts? Do you have US employees? Do you have contractors that are contractors, but um, they only work for you, right? You try to get creative with the, um, with the consulting agreement and say, well, you're a contractor, but really you're, you know, they're only working for you. They look more like an employee. Do you have to travel to the U.S. at all to work, even if it's just a little bit, let's say only a couple days a year? These are all issues that could trigger that USTOB problem. So, um, yeah, so that covers it. Um, if you have any questions, please leave me a comment below. Um, very much appreciate you sticking with me to the end here, and I hope to see you again on the next video. All right, thank you so much.